Hey, it's Mr. Seidel. You're in the Sculpture 2 classroom, and you're watching Leopard Spotlight. <laughs> Welcome everybody to Leopard Spotlight. I'm Sylvia Hansen. And I'm Shivani Radhakrishnan. In this edition, we'll follow the trail of some heroic canines. We'll take a look at One Junior's unique art installation. And finally, in our In the Club segment, we'll find a group where making it up as you go along isn't so bad. But first, we'll take you to the softball field, where the players are saying a special goodbye to a person who has made a big impact on their lives. Jeff Roberts, high school softball coach and assistant principal, impacts students both on the diamond and off. Coach Roberts has been my coach for four years. He's taught me so many life lessons. I'm way more mature than I was my freshman year, which is kind of cool because he's gotten to witness that all through these past four years and watch me develop into a young lady that I am. He's literally there for us through everything, no matter what it is, on or off the field. He's a great support system to have. Roberts has a special bond with his players that goes beyond his coaching requirements. Uh, my wife Christy and I have opened our home up to these young ladies and uh, we call it a family and it really is. Um, they are so special and I, could, I couldn't really ever put it into words. We're a family so we're all really close to Coach Roberts. Like. He's a mentor to every single one of us, I would say. Like, for myself, I could speak for myself that he's a mentor to me. Though Roberts cares deeply for all his players, he will be walking away from coaching next school year to devote his time to his wife and kids. I don't know that I can put into words what the girls on our team mean to me. Um, I've had 12 years of coaching high school softball, and every single one of those that I have had the opportunity to work with mean a great deal to me. It's been a great year. I've learned a ton both as an assistant principal and as a head coach, but really the reason I made the decision uh, comes down to my own family. Uh, my wife is a, is a nurse and she's currently going back to school to get her RN, and I've got two little kids at home. Uh, my son's a kindergartner uh, over at Hart, and then I have a nine-month-old, and that nine-month-old for the past four or five months I really haven't seen much of, and, and that's difficult. Um, my little baby girl means the world to me, and I want to spend some time with both my young kids. Though Roberts will still be with the school as an assistant principal, it will be a new chapter for both himself and his players. I think there will definitely be a different vibe than there is this year. I think I'm going to miss every Friday. He has a story basically about how like if you make bad decisions in life it's going to affect everyone in your family around you and it's just a good life lesson to always know and always count on and I think I'm going to miss that a lot too. It'll be different to see him uh, from the other side of the fence but I will be there uh, to support them all the time. My family will still be coming to support them. Um, they're a part of us and we're a part of them and that's how it'll always be. Um, once a lady leopard, always a lady leopard. This is Bradley Davis and Hayden McKenzie reporting for the Lovejoy News Network. Dogs provide companionship and service for many in our community. But one particular breed has a long history in saving lives when tragedy or disaster strikes. Clayton and Sophie sniff out our next story. When visiting the quiet fields and farms of Pastoral Island, chances are you'll meet plenty who have done volunteer work for their community. Resident David Daniel and his wife Sue gave years of civic service to the public. But unlike firefighters or city planners, his profession involved a partnership with man's best friend. When we first got into the uh, bloodhounds. Sue rescued a bloodhound from the Fort Worth shelter and as a result of her doing the rescue I got interested a couple of weeks later and that was some 20 years ago. The hounds are specifically used for trailing. That is they are scent specific uh, dogs otherwise they're only going to go locate one person associated with what is called a scent article. <clears throat> We've had four mission-ready trailing bloodhounds in our career. And he's not alone. 
He's called the Dallas-based Search One Rescue Team family for over 20 years. I checked on search and rescue groups and uh, I found one here in the Metroplex called Search One Rescue Team. Anyway, I, I took Boudreaux and we went over to the seminar in Mississippi and uh, Boudreaux was doing an incredible job. And so I'd signed up for two more training seminars and I asked David to take the dog to those and um, I never got him back. He was hooked. And um, David Daniel became one of the best handlers in the state of Texas. And he was one of the first to give bloodhound testimony in Texas. It isn't nearly as easy as it sounds, though. Getting a bloodhound ready for a search takes months of intense training, and some dogs just don't make the cut. To get one to become mission ready, it's a process that takes about 18 months of training. And you go through certain different levels of advancements to reach the goal of being mission ready. And your final test of becoming mission ready is one that is uh, unknown to the handler or the canine. And it's in an area that they've never trained in before. I had one that uh, did not work out. That was our dog that we kept as a pet. Even though this job is behind him now, David still keeps an important message in mind. I call it connectivity. The handler and the dog, it's important that they're connected because they're, when they're working, they're working with the lead, the dog's in a harness, and that's your tie to that animal. And you gotta be able to understand what he's telling you. The handler cannot think for the dog. The handler must think with the dog. This is Clayton Houts and Sophie Antonick reporting for the Lovejoy News Network. Religion and art have intersected for centuries, but Junior Cassidy Lichtenberg has found her own way of expressing this connection between the spiritual and material worlds. Grayson and Fallon show us more. Junior AP artist Cassidy Lichtenberg draws inspiration from religion and material possessions. So basically what I'm aiming to do is build a modern day altar um, to represent our common tendency to use clothing and outer appearance, such as like jewelry or accessories or shoes, to justify ourselves. Um, we build these things up on pedestals thinking that they're going to make us better or they're going to make us um, more popular or they're just going to better our lives. Um, and so by my artwork, I'm aiming to kind of expose those attempts. All of this is my stuff um, because I fall into using my clothing to justify myself as well. So the clothes are mine, the shoes are mine, pretty much everything is mine unless I needed something specific. Aside from personal objects, Cassidy would also use other items from people to emphasize something important. Um, so an example of this would be some of the um, incense that I'm burning. We can smell it in here right now because it's super strong, um, but a lot of times in different religions, not only incense, but also candles are used to display um, life and light and connect to um, the gods that like these altars are being built for. And so a lot of this is based off of Old Testament altars that God would call his people to make for them as they are trying to, to sacrifice animals or sacrifice things that they had in order to get right with God. Um, and so by building a modern day altar, kind of combining different altars of different religions, I look to kind of, like I said, expose the attempts that we, that we try to use our clothing to justify us. The form is, is important. The action of creating the work is important, but the content is what's most important to her. It's, it's cathartic in a sense and that she's working through these, this, this, this idea that, that your work is an extension of a belief or an extension of an idea and that that idea can impact other people. And so for her switching from painting these altars that she builds to simply building the altar and, and using it as an installation, it makes the viewer have a different role because the viewer gets to interact with the actual altar instead of, re instead of a replication of it. And so I feel like going three-dimensional or going where it's more of a, an installation changes the way people approach it. A lot of Cassidy's earlier art pieces were paintings rather than just altars. All of them are a lot smaller, um, but they are super symbolic still of us using jewelry and clothes and, and accessories, like I've said, to um, build ourselves up, just like commonly um, in religions. It's, it's used um, to get right with God or to get right with whatever you think um, the divine being might be um, among that specific religion. 
This is Grayson Knight and Fallon Brothers reporting for the Love Joy News Network. We close our show with this week's In the Club feature. Shivani and Andrew take us to the black box where the actors take winging it to the next level. Lovejoy Unscripted is the school's improv troupe, founded three years ago by theater teacher Jessica Brewster. Though improv is about being spontaneous, Lovejoy Unscripted is more than just fun and games. Um, over time, we grew the troupe size, and Mr. Doyle is now our sponsor. Um, but both the directors really try to let it be student led and student run. And we do three shows a semester, about. We try to add more or less depending on people's schedules and the school calendar. But we just get together to have improv and grow as actors. Um, it started because Miss Brewster just wanted an improv troupe for the sake of having shows. Improv is really just acting without a script. Um, but in our club, we try to teach people how to do it for fun, like for comedy, but also how to apply it to their acting lives. And I think that it really helps the people who are in it. Like you can see improvement from the beginning to the end of the year when they're not very good at improv -ing and then they're able to translate it into how they act on stage. Throughout the year, the club puts on many performances which correspond to the season or events happening around the school. We've had a lot of shows this year, um, going from, we had a Christmas themed one, a, a Valentine's themed one, um, and then I think our upcoming one is more like about summer and graduation. So we just kind of try to keep a theme so that it's more like relatable and people are like, oh yeah, that's happening right now. So yeah, that's funny. While I don't have a script to memorize or a set to build, improv prepares for shows by playing games to help them think on their feet and improve their acting skills. So some of the most basic ones are freeze and that is where you have two actors uh, stand on stage and they act, begin to act out a scene and then one uh, another member of the troupe will yell freeze and the actors have to freeze in the exact position they are and then the new actor will come and replace one of the two they can choose and then the, they can either resume a new scene in exactly the same position or they can build off that previous scene in you know, uh, the same story. And our styles of comedy are pretty different but to see that kind of blend and as we work together we learn how to act with each other and know our differences in comedy and use that to our advantage rather than to our disadvantage. And just being in the practices, there's no strict order to doing things. We're just there to play and have a good time and get games done and improve ourselves. This is Shivani Radhakrishnan and Andrew Khalil reporting for the Lovejoy News Network. We hope you enjoyed these stories. Until next time, I'm Sylvia Hansen. And I'm Shivani Radhakrishnan. And remember, if there's a story to find, we'll find it here on Leopard Spotlight.